I just want to start with the question. The question is this. How many of us here have a hard time reading the Bible and why? Hard time reading the Bible and why? Go ahead. It's difficult. It's difficult why? The language. The language is different? No, it doesn't. <laughs> Alright. The verse seems a lot deeper than it actually says, so it's kind of deep, deeper. Okay. <laughs> Okay, hard to understand what Jesus is trying to say sometimes. Okay, okay. Okay, good. Anyone else? Okay, go ahead. Parts of it are really dry. Okay, parts of it are really dry. Okay. That's true, I would agree. Go ahead. Boring. Okay, it's boring sometimes. Okay. Irrelevant. Like Leviticus and Numbers, right? Sorry, sorry if I offended you if you like Leviticus and Numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Leave a little more. Difficulty in reading the Bible and why? Okay, go ahead. It's not repetitive. Repetitive? Okay. Those are good. Uh, I would agree with a, a lot of things that you said. I think there are parts of the Bible where it is uh, repetitive, where it is boring, and you're trying to figure out what this means for your life. And so in this seminar, I just want to quickly just give you some principles of how to approach the Bible. And I hope that it will help you to not only read the Bible differently, but to understand it uh, as well. Uh, you know, we're just, you know, I had people share with one another, but I don't really have enough time. But anyone want to share with the group here just a, a favorite book or genre of the Bible and why? Favorite book. What I mean by genre is this, like, I like the prophets, or I like the teachings of Jesus, or I like the end times, or I like the Psalms. Go ahead. Proverbs. Okay, why? Because it's very relevant and like there's one like for every month. Okay. Are you going like a day? I mean, not, yeah, like a day for the month. Okay. Very relevant. Okay, good. Anyone else? Favorite book or genre that you like? Why? Okay, go ahead. I really like Romans. Romans, okay. Um, yeah, it's like Alvarez and Oscar. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, I love Romans too. Good. Maybe one more? Go ahead. Kings. Kings? Okay. Both? Both? Okay. Why? It's like a story is pretty wrong. I'm sorry? Uh, it's like a, it's like a, I like history. So it's like uh, okay, good. Okay. Good. You have your hand raised? Uh, I was just going to say the parables. Okay, the parables? Why? Because they're interesting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Uh, I just want to start with a big picture of how we should approach scripture. And I think if you can understand the big picture, I think it'll help you to, uh, I guess, understand the Bible better. I guess the big picture is this. The Bible is all about the mission of God, right? It's about God <coughs> trying to redeem His people. And God trying to basically make His name known throughout the nations. And so, you know, when you start at Genesis, when you read the epistles, when you read the Psalms, when you read narratives in the Old Testament, when you read the parables and the teachings of Jesus, we have to keep in mind that all of it is basically this mission of God, this story of God, God trying to advance His kingdom throughout culture and history. And so, I think if we kind of have the bigger picture in mind and the understanding of that, I think it kind of helps us to approach the Bible differently. Because I think a lot of the frustration that we have is that we get so into the nitty gritty and we don't understand certain sections. And you know, the, some of the Bible is hard. I have to admit, there are a lot of things in the Bible that's pretty hard. But I think it, it could help us if we understand well, what is God trying to do? What is the story? What is the purpose? So when you read books like Ruth, you know, it's kind of like this ordinary story of just a, a few women, and you know, one of them gets married. You know, we have to think about well, how does it? It's the mission of God. How does it apply the mission of God? Right. Through that line, obviously, King David was born. Through that line, then obviously, Jesus came about. And so we have to think about, well, how does this apply in the mission of God? We see God's purpose and mission starting at Genesis 3.15. In seminary, they use a technical term, you don't know, it's called Proto Evangelium, which is actually literally translated the first gospel. So here, starting in Genesis 3, uh, we see here that, you know, as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and we all spring and hers, he 
you will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So we see from, right from Genesis chapter 3, after the fall of man, God's purpose, God's redemption plan of trying to what? Crush Satan and trying to redeem people for his name's sake. Okay? And so I think if we start with a big picture of mine, hopefully it gives us a better understanding of what we're reading, how to understand the Bible. Uh, you know, so one thing I just forgot to say, you know, seminars, I, you know, it's pretty interactive, it's very informal. So if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to answer, uh, to raise your hand and uh, let me know. <coughs> I just want to start off with this verse. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved of workmen who does not need to be shamed. You can correctly handle the word of truth. And that's the whole goal of scripture. That's the whole goal for us as Christians. That we what? We learn to correctly handle the word of truth. Whether you have a seminary, seminary degree or not, whether you're just uh, a new believer or not, we want to learn how to handle God's word correctly in our own lives. What is the voice of the Bible? I think we want to start by talking about who wrote the Bible. Obviously, who wrote the Bible? God, right? Inspired, uh, man wrote it, inspired by God. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture by the inspiration of God. And if you read church history, I just took a church history class, it's just complicated. People, there are church fathers who came together and decided what books go into the Bible. We have to also believe in faith that they also were divinely inspired by God to get the Bible that we have today. When we think about the Bible, uh, even we have to, in faith, believe that God used people like the Apostle Paul. God, God used people like Moses who wrote, I think, the first five books of the Bible to write some of the things, the, write, you know, the story of God, the mission of God on paper so that we have the Bible that we have today. There are more than 30 different authors in their own writing style. Obviously, the Old Testament, most of it is Hebrew. There are actually some parts of it in Aramaic. Uh, I don't know anyone who actually studied Aramaic to know, you know, these certain portions of scripture. All the New Testament's in Greek, okay? Um, I'm going to talk about this later on, but I think going back to the original language sometimes helps. Because probably for all of us, you know, just some things get lost in translation. You know, as we try to, even maybe we know we're bilingual, and when we try to explain certain things to people in a, a native language, a different language, you know, the, trans, the translation gets lost, the literal meaning gets lost. Many authors wrote the words of their own writing style, but there is one mind behind God. And we just seek to guide us the Holy Spirit as we read the Bible. The power of God's Word. This is really important, okay? I think so when we talk about the importance of how we got to get our Bible, I think we also want to talk about what, you know, what to do. I think number one is living and active. 4.12 says this, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the body, soul, and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And so, it's like a probing instrument. And so, uh, you know, I, I think I just want to say this. It's really important that we understand the Bible. Because if we really believe that it is a double-edged sword that changes our lives, that it is active, then we got to know what it says. We have to understand what it says. I think many times, especially as Christians, you know this generation, we're considered the most biblically illiterate generation. That means we don't understand too much of the Bible. And many of us, we don't really experience too much transformation in our lives because even though it is living and active, we don't really understand what it says. We don't understand how it applies for you and I in our daily lives. And so, I think digging deeper into God's Word, understanding God's Word, it helps us and it changes us. I think many times, especially like in our generation, we get so caught up in emotional Christianity, where, you know, we love conferences. There are thousands of conferences out there, especially in America. We love great speakers. We love, not that these things are wrong. God, God uses these things. And we should get emotional for the Lord. You know, we should worship passionately. But I think the other side, the flip side of that is that we should be grounded in God's Word. We should understand what God's Word says. So that God's Word plus emotion, I think it, that makes a powerful Christian. 
But don't get so much so too caught up on the emotional side where it's just about how you feel or just emotions at a certain time or gosh, I'm just here to hear, to hear a great speaker. But I think to understand true Christianity, there's another part where you're biblically grounded in God's Word as well. There's a the power of God for salvation. Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, but it is, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and for the Gentile. Another thing that we need to understand is yeah, God's word does have the power for salvation, power, power for salvation. That's why I want to say, you know, when you if you have non-Christian parents or non-Christian friends, I think you should use God's word when you speak to them. Not that you're trying to sound religious or you know what we call Christian means when we try to use all these Christian jargon to sound more spiritual. But I think when people are really curious about God and seeking God, we should point them to the Bible. You should know certain passages of scripture where, yeah, God has a plan for salvation. Yeah, God has a purpose for forgiving sins. God has a perfect plan for your life. And so I think when we point people to scripture, we need to also believe in faith that does have the power to save people's lives and it has to drop us through. Like I said before, it has the power to change people's lives. Acts 2 37 says, when the people heard this, that was Peter preaching, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other prophets, brothers, what shall we do? And, uh, through that, they came to a state of repentance. But uh, I think one of the things that we need to understand is that, yes, the Word of God, as it is a double-edged sword, it does have the power to change our lives as well. The purpose is the Bible, okay? Obviously, it's God's spoken Word, but it also records the God's salvation plan, as we talked about. John 20, 31 says this, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. So, <clears throat> as we talked about, it is all about the mission of God, God's story, God's purpose in saving people. I think the second thing that His purpose, his purpose is, is it's, it's the doctrine. And I just want to take a minute just to explain, I think doctrine is very important. You know, for a believer. Um, it's to avoid personal opinion and heresy. And uh, I just briefly want to explain what heresy is. I think heresy, when I learned what heresy was, it always begins with a proper motive, but it turns into an overemphasis. Um, it's also to avoid misguided reliance on the Holy Spirit. And so I think one of the purposes of the Bible is that we draw out rich doctrine from the Bible. Right? Things like in seminaries, you know, things like Christology, the study of who Jesus is. Things like, I'm trying to remember, pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit. Uh, things like eschatology, the study of the church. Uh, I, I think some of these doctrines, I, actually, not some of I think a lot of these doctrines, we should have a basic understanding as a Christian. You should know some of the doctrines of Christology, of who Christ was. What were some of his attributes? What made him so neat? Was he fully man or fully God? You know, how did, you know, how did the Holy Spirit work within him? You know, I think some of these things you should be curious about. You should be curious about why you believe in things that you believe. You know, when you think about, talk about things like the Holy Spirit, you know, what is the Holy Spirit? What is the role of the Holy Spirit? You know, what is the Trinity? Are they all the same? Are they three different entities? And I just want to say this, I think as a believer, as you grow more in maturity, uh, I think you should have a deeper understanding of doctrine. You know, now obviously there's the extreme where people just want to know too much doctrine and they get so caught up in knowing so much, but you know, it doesn't really bring a lot of life change. I think it should be a balance of both, but doctrine is important. And uh, <clears throat> we were having a discussion in the last seminar group, but there are certain doctrines that, especially amongst the AMI community, we're not gonna we're not gonna fight and argue over things like should women get ordained. You know, I think that's more of a, a personal uh, preference and conviction of the pastor who's in charge of that church, right? You can write a lot. You can look up a lot of doctrine on that. For example, like praying in tongue. You know, I know that's a very big topic, right? There's a lot of doctrine on that. And I think 
you as a, as a believer should look at what Scripture says. Look at what other people say. Look at what other resources and try to figure out what your personal conviction is in terms of these different areas of your life. Obviously, there are certain doctrines in the Christian faith that are essential, like who Christ is, how salvation works, who the Holy Spirit is. These things are essential, and these things should be the foundation of your faith, but there are also a lot of non, uh, I guess, essential doctrines that we can, you know, fight and argue about. Any questions up to this point before we move on? Good? Alright. Second thing, so our instruction manual. God's word is profitable for doctrine, as we talked about, for reproof, for correction, for instruction. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. So, obviously, we all know this as believers, but the way that we live our life is obviously the instruction of the Bible, right? In areas like relationships, friendships, sin, uh, in areas like marriage, how to raise children, um, how to get involved in a local church, the importance of church. All this can be found through Scripture. And so, you know, obviously we should listen to our pastor and, you know, what he preaches, but I hope it's also backed up with the sense of, well, this instruction manual that I have is also for me as well. I can read it. I can draw out doctrine. I can apply different things that's uh, said in Scripture. Uh, we have to, we have to go, go through this body. Study, read it, obey it. One thing I do want to say is this. Jesus says this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Right? And that's very important because I think loving God with your mind is a vital relationship. Uh, is a vital part of our relationship with God. Right? You can serve someone you don't know, but you cannot love someone you don't have to know. God wants us to know them through His Word. And so, you know, this is what I was saying earlier. To love God with all of your uh, soul, strength, and you know, mind. You know, in terms of we love God as we love Scripture, right? If you don't love Scripture, then I would say you need to examine your relationship with God. Now, you know, that doesn't discount. Yes, there are portions of Scripture where it is boring, where you might not understand God's purpose in this as you read the laws of Le Leviticus, right? But there are obviously other portions of Scripture like Romans where it's very rich in theology. It's very rich in terms of uh, who man is, who God is. And so I really hope that you have this approach in terms of, oh Lord, I love you through also your word and understanding your word as well. Books of the Bible, just real quickly. There's the law from Genesis to Deuteronomy. This is what I was talking about, the whole vision of God, okay? And obviously after that, there's Joshua through Esther. Genesis through Deuteronomy is the very beginning. Creation. It talks about the fall of mankind. It talks about how uh, God gave this man named Abraham a, a promise that he was going to basically uh, make, make a nation through his offspring. And we see that through the beginning, what happens is God calls his people Israel, Joshua through Esther is basically God working and trying to redeem his people Israel as they were rebelling. If you read the book of Judges, all of Judges is this. It's basically God's people rebel, they repent, they turn back to God. And that's the whole cycle of Judges. And that's, I think that's the whole cycle when you, talk, when you look at the history of Israel. It's basically they're on good terms with God, they rebel against God, they worship other gods, they worship Baal, right? God forgives them, and it's this whole cycle of God redeeming his people. There's poetry, Job, Solomon, there's the major prophets. The only reason why they're major is because they have the most written on them, right? <laughs> Nothing to note this on them. Minor prophets, Hosea and Malachi. And, uh, you know, when you look at the Old Testament, it's obviously the vision of God, God redeeming his people, but also the coming of Jesus Christ. If your Christ comes in the New Testament, the gospel, the life of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus. We see the history of the early church. We see this great man named Paul and his writings. It's uh, the general epistles to Hebrews through Jude and the end times when we come to Revelation. Okay. We're not going to go through this. I just want to say a few things. I just put these translations through this. I give you all the slides here. You guys can take 
the Old Testament moral law, but he had this for reference as well. I think translation is important. Uh, at our church, we use the ESV. ESV is a little bit more literal translation. Uh, uh, translation. When I read the ESV, I like it, but some of the sentences I read are very, very uh, not. What's the word I want to use? Uh, it doesn't really make sense in our vocab today. Uh, it, it's just the sentence structure is really weird. And so uh, I would say this: I, I think NIV is a good balance between the both. Right? You might not get a complete literal, literal translation of what it says, but you're not going to get a paraphrase, paraphrase version as well. There's also uh, today NIV. I think that's also a good Bible. I would say this: for if you have a new Christian, right, or someone just comes to faith, I don't know if I would give them an ESV. I think maybe I would start off with the NIV or a, a today uh, uh, NIV, so that they can get a little more balanced version of Scripture. Who Jesus is. Uh, if you want to, you know, for, for yourself, for your own uh, growth, for your own depth of knowledge, I think, I think choosing any of the more literal translations is good to see how, uh, you know, what the original language says. Things like the New Living Translation, the message, I also feel like once in a while they're pretty good. Like, even when I prepare a sermon, I actually will refer, refer to the message by Eugene Peterson. How many of you guys have read the message before? Parts of it. Okay, it's actually, I think it's actually pretty decent. Like for one example, like a couple weeks ago, I preached on uh, James chapter 3 about taming the tongue. And one portion that the ESV said, you know, no one could tame the tongue. Like, uh, you know, we've, we've tamed wild beasts in the air, but no one could tame the tongue. But I think the message it said like, you know, we basically put every all these animals in zoos, and we tamed the tiger, but the tongue is a killer, or something like that. And, you, know, you know, you know, it's kind of funny, but actually, like, I actually used it because I think it kind of gives a better imagery of what the Bible is trying to say. So, you know, obviously for your devotion, I will not use this paraphrased version, paraphrased version, but I think just for a different slant on it or different flavor on maybe a certain passage of the Bible. I think it's good to, to read uh, the message. All right. This is where we kind of get to the meat part of this. Okay, what is exegesis? Okay, these are fancy words that you learn in seminary. Okay. Exegesis is this, careful systematic study of scripture to discover the original intended meaning. Uh, how the historical context, literary context, and what's the goal? To find out the original intent of the words of the Bible. When I took a preaching, when I took a preaching class, all we did was this thing called exegesis. Right? So you take a verse or passage of the Bible, and what you're doing is you're basically uh, going as deep as possible in what this passage really means. So things like we would basically read historical books of uh, you know, what was the historical context? Like, you know, for example, like, I think it's in Luke chapter 18. When, you, when Jesus tells the parable of the tax collector and Pharisee. If you don't know, have any idea of how a tax collector was viewed back then, or how a Pharisee was viewed back then, you probably don't have an understanding of why this parable had any meaning, or why Jesus taught this parable, right? Um, and so I think a historical context and you know, a literary context of you know, what was going on back then, I think it's helpful. And so exegesis is basically you're just trying to get deep into God's word. If we have to look at the original language, I don't think you need to really do that in your everyday devotions. But I th also I think it's very helpful that you just try to go beyond surface level understanding. If there should be something within us where, man, maybe this has a deeper meaning. And you know what I hear mean? <coughs> messages and I read commentaries, man, I was blown away. Like, man, I didn't know. Uh, this verse actually meant this, or man, I never thought of it that way. And so I think it's really important that we learn to get deeper in terms of the original meaning or the original intent of uh, a certain verse. Certain tools for exegesis that I recommend, I would recommend the Bible Dictionary. Um, I think you could actually find one online or you could purchase one. Bible Dictionary actually just basically explains, you know, like, uh, for example, if you look up the word Israel, 
You know, it'll kind of give you a uh, definition of the, who the Israelites were and their importance in uh, history. If you look up, you know, someone like uh, uh, like tax collector, as I used earlier, it'll kind of give you, you know, uh, these are how tax collectors were viewed. Uh, we know that they were very hated among society, and I kind of think it gives you a better understanding. There's commentaries. I don't think you need to run out buy commentaries, but there are a lot of sources online. You'd be amazed at some of the sources that you get online. And then obviously there's original language books if you're really into the original language. I think a lot of this stuff you can also find online as well. Hermeneutics. What is hermeneutics? I think a whole class of hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is this. Basically, you're trying to find the contemporary relevance, right? Exegesis, you're trying to find the original intent, you're trying to get deeper into the word. Hermeneutics is this. Uh, basically, you're asking the Bible's meaning in the here and now, right? What does this mean, right? So, hermeneutics is this. When, we, when I took, uh, you know, seminary classes, first we will start with exegesis, then we will go into hermeneutics in terms of, well, what does this mean for the, for the average reader? Right? Because you can't just end in exegesis. You can't just end by, oh, well, this was Paul's intent when he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel in Romans 1.16, right? And, uh, you know, this is what the Greek says. And, you know, oh, what does he mean for the Jew and the Gentile? Does it mean that everyone's saved, right? It can't just stop there, right? It's got to move on to another level in what we call hermeneutics of what does this mean for you and I? What does this mean for maybe the pastor who's preaching on Sunday? There's got to be a connecting point of how does this fit into my life and our life? Four basic principles I just want to go through. Okay, number one is observation. Second is interpretation. Three is assessment, application. I think if we could read the Bible in this way, I think it would really transform the way that we read, approach the Bible. Right? Some people also call this um, inductive Bible study. Uh, I think there are different for it. But number one, okay, as you read the Bible, I think first you want to start with observation, right? Always start with prayer. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand the text you're about to read. Read the text carefully. Every word is important. Every story is important. So, you know, as you read the Bible, uh, you know, you first start by, uh, you know, for me, I just want to get a general understanding of what the passage is saying. I'm not getting into the nitty gritty. I'm not trying to get into uh, the original, you know, the language or whatever like that. I'm just trying to understand what is this passage is generally saying uh, to me, right? And I think that's where we're going to start. Put aside your bias, preconceived ideas that you have acquired from movies. Uh, you know, when we think about observation of what's going on in the text, uh, we need to get rid of this whole idea because, you know, in the media, especially there's a lot of Bible bashing and uh, there are a lot of people who don't like Christianity. And I think there's false images that are portrayed, especially in society, that we actually bring into the Bible as we read. Right? For example, this. What's wrong with this picture? This is the birth of Jesus. Anyone? Read the birth of Jesus. We may think about this. 
But when you actually read what really went on, it, well, it didn't really look like this, you know. Some observation questions I just kind of threw in, for example. The displays crowd the God in Exodus 2. The God first Adam in Genesis chapter 3. The Jonah preached repentance. The Saul's name change to Paul upon conversion. And so, you know, as you read, you know, what you're, whatever you're reading, yeah, I think these are some just general questions that you should think about. I mean, these are, these are specific to the text, but, you know, you should write down questions as you do your devotion. Interpretation. Consider the, the context in which the, con the text was written. Consider the author's intent and long intended uh, interpretations for me. Uh, interpretation is very important. When you read the scripture, uh, you should have um, a general understanding of what the author is trying to say. You know, and that's why I say context is very important. Because if we don't have a, uh, a if we don't read the what you're reading in context, I think we can misconstrue what uh, the Bible is saying. That's how a lot of cults start, actually. What they do is they take a certain passage of scripture and they actually uh, take it out of context. And what happens is it, that becomes a cult. They kind of hang on to one idea or one thought and, um, you know, that's how you become a cult leader. Interpretation is very important also because it helps you understand um, not only what you're reading, but I think it should also help you to go to other resources of what you're trying to understand. Right? There are certain part, part, uh, portions of the Bible, even for myself, who's uh, going through seminary, it's just hard. You know, it's just hard. You know, we don't understand. Uh, like, you know, there's a certain portion of Hebrews where it's like, man, can someone really lose their salvation? And uh, I think it might be like Hebrews 11 or something. I don't know, it's just really, it's just, it's just, you know, it's like, can someone really lose their salvation? And it's like, it just gets really sticky. And so, interpretation, I think it should also be you to use other resources. What do other people say? Um, read other commentaries. I was saying this in the last seminar. I know some of us, we love to listen to sermons. Right? And I think it's good. We love to listen to other people's sermons. Uh, I know some people who really love Tim Keller. Tim Keller, Keller is a great preacher. I'm not denying that. But I think for us as believers, I wholeheartedly recommend that you should learn to learn to listen to a variety of preachers as long as they have solid biblical teaching. Uh, you shouldn't just depend on what Tim Keller is saying. But Tim Keller is great, okay? I'm not denying that. Great preacher, great theology, but I think in order for us to be broader as Christians, I think we should try to try to see what the different views are. What does John Piper say? What does Mark Driscoll say about, about certain uh, views? Christianity and doctrine. Assessment. What does this text say about God? What does it say about man? I think this is very important. As we go into observation, as we then go into interpretation, I think we should ask ourselves, what does this text say about God itself? What does it say about man? If we take the example of the tax collector and Pharisee in Luke chapter 18, there's a lot of things that we say about God. God exalts those who are what? Humble, right? God desires repentance. When we look about, we look about what does God say about man? God doesn't look at the outward appearance. God doesn't look at the Pharisees' outward appearance. But what? God looks at the heart. And so these are questions you want to ask yourself as you read the scripture. What does this say about God? What does this say about man? Those are some examples I just put up. You have in your uh, notes there. And obviously application. What does this text mean to me? How should I live from now on? The first three doesn't matter if this doesn't happen, right? You could do all the observation, you could do all the inter interpretation, you could do all the uh, assessment, you could do all the, the exegesis you want, you could go into all the resources, but if this doesn't happen, then it doesn't really matter. This is the end goal of why you do your devotion. This is the end goal of why you read your scripture, or why you, why you read the Bible, because it has to be applied in your life. That's why in James 2 it says, do not only be hearers of the word, but what? Be doers of the word. And so it's so important that as we dig deep into God's word, it's got to result in, it's got to change me. It's got to make me live differently. 
It's got to help me to forgive people. It's got to help me to love other people. It's got to help me to serve other people in a specific way. And so this is really important. You know, don't just pass this by them. It's got to lead to some kind of lead to some kind of application. We talked about different genres of how we can do that. Uh, I just want to really just is there any questions up to this point? Anything that I talked about or maybe even didn't address? Nothing? You, know, you guys are really tired you guys and want me to end soon, or you guys are just pretty good. I had a lot of questions last night. Actually, before I go on, a couple books I just want to recommend. I actually got a lot of uh, this uh, seminar for this book. It's called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. It's a pretty good book by Gordon Fee. And uh, he basically just goes like, you know, the Gospels. How do you read the Gospels? How do you read the parables? Um, how do you read the Old Testament narratives? How do you read the law? How do you read the prophets? This is pretty good. And it gives you just a, a, a basic understanding of how you should read the Bible in different genres it um, goes, that it presents. There's another guy who named Howard Hendricks. And um, I forget the title of the book. Living by the Book. Living by the Word, I think it's called. That's a pretty good book as well. Kind of gives you some similar strategies to the Bible. I just quickly just want to go over uh, narrative reading strategies. I just picked one, but I think this could work for even reading things like the gospel and even um, like something like the parables. And uh, I just picked narrative because a lot of people ask me, well, how do I read the Old Testament? You know, the Old Testament's long, uh, some of it's very complex. And a lot of the Old Testament, it is narrative, it's stories that people wrote down about different characters. And so hopefully this will kind of give you an idea of how to look at a narrative. A large section of the Bible is narrative. More than one third of the Hebrew Bible is narrative. What is a narrative? It's an account of events. It's any work of literature that tells a story. And uh, in a narrative, there are actually uh, action and action bearers. There's some kind of action going on. There's people who do the action. What a narrative is not. It's just not a story of people who live in Old, Old Testament and New Testament time. Again, remember, when we read through narratives, we're trying to, trying to focus on this idea of what is the mission of God? What is God doing? What is the purpose of God? So when you read stories like Joseph and David and uh, King Solomon or King Saul, right? It's always got to, you got to think in the back of your mind, how is this part of God's redemption redemption story. God's bigger purpose as I read through these characters. They're just not singular characters like a Harry Potter book where it's all about Harry Potter and you're trying to figure out what happens next. But there's a bigger story as you read through uh, these different characters and narratives. They're not allegories or stories for these hidden meanings. And they do not always teach directly. For example, you know, I just said Joseph. Uh, at the end of Joseph, we all know what happens. His brother comes to him and he forgives his brothers, he weeps, and uh, there's no direct teaching, right? Moses didn't write, so you ought to also forgive those who hurt you or wronged you. No, there's not a teaching like that. But through the story, we can draw principles. Through the narrative, we can draw teachings from that. And so I think that's where we talk about this whole idea of, you know, observation, interpretation, assessment, and application. We draw out uh, some of those, these teachings that as, as we read through some of these narratives. Components of an average plot and characterization. I think we all know what plot is, sequence of events. The plot consists of four stages. There's the exposition, there's the conflict, the climax, <coughs> and the resolution. The exposition is setting the background of the story, the problem, the climax, and the resolution. For example, like Let's say we just kind of go like the fall of King David and, and, and uh, with Sheba, right? We know the background is saying King David was the king of Judah. Uh, the conflict, the problem right there where what happens? He sees the woman. He says, bring me to her. There's the conflict, there's tension of whether he should sleep with her or not. The climax, we know what happens. Sleep with her. We know the resolution. Basically, 
Uh, he sends people to kill her husband Uriah. And after that, the whole kingdom of Judah and Israel be it becomes a mess. So I just did a brief summary of just one story, but I think when you look at the narrative, especially old, old Testament narrative, you should kind of draw out what is the setting, what is the background, what is the problem going on, what's the decisive moment, and what's the outcome? You know, what's the outcome? What did God do? What did man do in this whole process? There's also characterization. You know, we want to look at different characters in these different narratives. Two types of characters. Number one, there's a flat character, a one-dimensional character, possesses a single trait, and then there's the round character, who are complex, have more than one trait. Flat characters, you're probably gonna not learn, you're probably not going to learn a lot of lessons from them. For example, like Abel, right? We'll look at this passage in Genesis chapter uh, four later. But probably you're not gonna walk away with a lot of lessons. Whereas Cain, he was a little bit more round, right? The Bible explains a little bit more about him, right? What his motives were, what some of the things that he did. And there are probably a lot more lessons that we could draw out from the life of Cain. In character, I think this is very important. As you read the Bible, two major traits. You want to look at the outward appearance and inward personality, right? Outward appearance. For example, Saul, he was a head taller than any of the others. Goliath, he was uh, over nine feet tall. Abram said to his wife, I know what a beautiful woman you are. And, you know, I think these things are important. These things are important. As you read the Bible, you should have a general understanding of uh, what made these characters so unique. You know, what made Goliath so unique? He was tall, right? He was a warrior. What made Saul very unique? He was basically a head taller than anyone, any of the other people, and that's why one of the reasons why he got picked. Another thing is this, the inner personality. What makes Noah so unique? What the Bible explains right here. It says he was a righteous man, he was blameless, and he walked with God, right? The men of Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, we all know Sodom and Gomorrah. What made them so unique? What, they were wicked, and they were great sinners against the Lord. Eli's sons. Eli's sons were wicked men, and they had no regard for the Lord. So as you read the Bible, especially as you read narratives, these are some of the things you think you should be picking up. These are some of the things you should be writing down, right? What makes these people so significant? What makes these people so unique? And from there, I think you could draw out some lessons or principles for your life. Techniques, we're not going to go into this, you can read it on your own. Uh, you know, repetition, both and old and new testament is very important. If something is repetitious, for example, uh, when they explain God, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, God Almighty. Repetition is important. Emphasizing the holiness of God. Duplication as incidents, repetition of synonyms. Um, Deuteronomy 7.5 says, this is what I want you to do with them. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their ashes poles, and burn their idols in the fire. So, you know, as you're reading through narratives or even portions of the Bible, some of these techniques or some of these uh, repetitions uh, should basically draw out of you. If, it, if you see a lot of repetition, it probably means this is very important. Right? There are some lessons that you can probably learn from some of this. Consecutive verbs, uh, same principle, the a lot of consecutive verbs, uh, they're probably something that's special or interesting about that certain passage. <coughs> Alright, applying narrative reading strategy. This is what I want you to do, okay? We don't have too much time, I want to actually give us some time to do this. I want you to read. Get into groups of three or four. Now, I want you to read Genesis chapter 4, verses, I think it's 1 through 16. It's the story of Cain and Abel, right? And in this story, I want you to basically talk about what is the exposition, what's the conflict, what's the climax, and what's the resolution. And after all of that, I want you to talk about well, what's some, what are some applications that you could draw out from the story of Cain and Abel, okay? So why don't we do that for the next, like, 
10 minutes or so, and then we'll come back and then we'll close our seminar. Okay? In Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Okay? What else? Okay, good. Can you what Adam and Adam need? Good. What else? Okay, good. Good. What's the conflict? Such a so time. 
That's what the application needs in our life. It's something that's accessible, right? It's something that's attainable. There's a goal to it, right? You can easily attain it. Not just some generalities where it's like, oh, I'm just going to be more loving, or I'm going to try to share the gospel more, right? Yes, we're all called to share the gospel more, but to who, right? When? When are you going to do that, right? I think a specific application is on Friday afternoons from 1 to 3, I'm going to commit to sharing the gospel in uh, my dorm hall or whatever it may be. That's what application is. That's what you should walk away with as you think about reading your Bible. You talked about this, you guys did a good job. <clears throat> a couple of things that you, you know, I just want to throw out there. These are, I think, a lot of things that you said, okay? In this particular instance, Adam and Eve, they were flat characters, right? There, were, there wasn't really much said about them, right? We all know that they just gave birth to them. For Cain, uh, we just, as someone said, he was a careless worshiper. He was selfish. He was angry, jealous, deceitful, murderer, and denial, rebellious, and responsible. For Abel, he was a true worshiper. He gave his best, and his priority was God first. And uh, obviously, the Lord desires a faithful heart. Someone said people right here, he holds men accountable, he's just, he's loving, and he's merciful. And so, a lot of these things that you guys said, this is the way that you should approach the Bible as well. Obviously, we talked about this, what does this text say about God, what does this text say about man? Okay. Any questions that you guys have? <laughs> no questions? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, I'm sorry, what was your name? Victor. Victor, okay. How should we take, you know, like, there's like old law, like the like, and stuff like that. Yeah. So, like, I mean, how should we take that? Or just like, should we, like, do like, general context? Because honestly, we can't take it literally. Yeah, yeah. But, like, so, like, what's the best way of, like, looking at it? Because, like, probably a lot of times, like, when people, like, bash the Bible or something like that, they're, like, being like, very specific stuff, and I don't know what to say. Yeah. <laughs> When you look at Old Testament law, um, I think a couple of things that, that, that come to mind is this. Obviously, man cannot live up to the law. You know, so for me, when you read the laws of Leviticus, I would just recommend don't get bogged down into it. Like, you know, what does this literally mean? And can I do this now? Or I think you should try to use other resources, but <clears throat> when you read, you know, because Someone said it here, Romans, it all talks about us breaking the law, falling short of the law. So when I read Leviticus, it just shows me how much I can't live up to the standard of God, right? Because you're trying to look at the bigger picture, right? Of, man, the law, I, I, I fall so short. That's why we need a Savior. That's why we need one who came to fulfill the law, which is in Christ. And so it, even in that way, it should point to, well, I see Christ. Because Christ didn't fulfill the law. And He's the one that made me righteous as one who, he sees me as one who didn't break any of the law, you know, because of Christ. And so, I think that's the best way to look at it. I think it's also good just to see how God was a God of law and order. He was just. He was a God who um, did want man to live by a set of principles. I think that's the way I would approach it. Uh, someone asked me about Levit Leviticus in the last seminar. Um, you know, Leviticus, when I read Leviticus, uh, it's one of those books where I just, some people love it, I just try to get a general idea of what it says, I try to briskly pass along through it, but I don't get bothered, I know some people might argue with me, well, I love Leviticus, and I know people who do, um, but I think just even reading the law, it helps you appreciate New Testament as well, you know, appreciate, it helps you appreciate Jesus, it helps you appreciate Romans and some of the letters that Paul wrote, how we fall so short of the law. So that, I think that's the way I would, I would answer that. Any other questions you guys have? Yeah. So like on the law, since like a lot of the Old Testament laws were kind of like redeemed with the New Testament, so we just follow like the Old Testament. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, you know, Old Testament talks about tithing. You know, we still talk, we still do tithing here. Uh, Old Testament talks a lot about adultery, you know, um, and so it's not that we banish the Old Testament, but, um, how do I see this? 
there are obviously certain laws back then that don't apply to us today just because culturally it's just different. Uh, and so when we look at Christ as the fulfillment of the law, so you know, when we place our trust in Christ, we, we are ones who no longer have broken the law, but fulfilled the law because of Jesus. Go ahead.